This is a good start. Everybody's back in the seats. I really appreciate it because we have so much we want to share with you that uh, we need to stay on schedule on it. Appreciate everybody's cooperation. As I said before, we're going very austere on our introductions uh, because you do have them hyperlinked uh, in the agenda. So we want to save the most time we can for discussion. This is a super important panel. Uh, I think it's on everybody's mind. It's certainly uh, on the minds of students in my class, but I think it's on everybody's mind everywhere. And it's a complicated subject, and I think we'll find out it's more complicated than it may seem uh, if you just look at headlines. But it's, it's something we all need to be up to speed on, and we have a really great panel. I'm just going to just have a few words about Dave Graham. Dave Graham was a mentor of mine. Uh, he was a guru. It's not even strong enough to say what he was when he was in the Army and then for many years at the Army JAG School and at the center at, uh, in UVA. And now he's uh, been gracious enough to moderate this panel and to organize it. And without further ado, Dave, well, thank you, Charlie, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we have a, a lot to cover, so let's get right at it. And the first thing I need to do is to introduce our, our panelists. Uh, their bios are, and other materials that you have, so I'm going to be very brief, but I do want to introduce them. Uh, Professor Jeff Korn. Jeff is the George R. Killam, Jr. Chair of Criminal Law and the director of the Center for Military Law and Policy at the Texas Tech University School of Law. Professor Laurie Blank. Laurie is the clinical professor of law and the director of the International Humanitarian Law Clinic at the Emory University School of Law. And I mentioned that currently Laurie's on a one-year leave of absence serving as a special counsel to the DOD general counsel. And we're very pleased to have with us Professor Rob Lawless. Rob is the Associate Professor of Law in the Department of Law at the U.S. Military Academy, as well as serving as the Research Director of the Lieber Institute for Law and Warfare. Rob also serves as the Editorial Board on the Editorial Board of the West Point Press. Our process is going to be very straightforward today. I'm going to pose questions to individual panelists, and I'm going to pose questions to the panel as a whole. Now to place our discussion this morning in context, I want to exercise the prerogative of the chair and I want to stipulate to two very important overarching facts. The first of these is that the conflict we're dealing with in Ukraine is what we call an Article II armed conflict. By that I mean it is an international armed conflict, a state on state armed conflict. And that's important for a number of different reasons. But most importantly, it means that as it is an international armed conflict, all of the law of armed conflict applies. All of the customary law of armed conflict, all of the codified law of armed conflict. The second issue that I want to stipulate to is the fact that the Russian Federation is engaging in an aggressive war against the state of Ukraine. And in so doing, it has and continues to violate the most basic norm contained in the United Nations Charter. And we know that is Article 2.4. That provision, which prohibits the use of force, or even the threat of the use of force, against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state. Now, in my view, this act of aggression, this waging of aggressive war, is an international crime, an international crime, and has been since the days of Nuremberg. An international crime for which those who have planned, conducted, and sustained this crime are accountable, and we'll get into that. Now, with these stipulated facts established, Let's move to a discussion of a number of the legal issues that have evolved from this conflict over the ensuing year. Okay. And Jeff, I'm going to come to you first. 
The Security Council has made no decision on Article 39 that the Russian Federation is engaged in an aggressive war. It's engaged in an act of aggression against Ukraine. Under Article 42, it hasn't called on all member states to take all measures necessary to prevent this aggression from occurring. So no action on the part of the Security Council at all. And yet NATO, the EU, any number of other states have provided a massive amount of material assistance. An exceptional amount of intelligence and target selection support to Ukraine. Some would say it's tipped the balance of the conflict. All of this without any authorizing authority from the Security Council. So Jeff, I guess my first question to you is, given all the assistance these states have provided, under what international legal authority are they acting? Well, thanks for the question, sir. I'd be remiss to not start by expressing my deep gratitude to my friend, Major General Dunlop, and to you and to my friends on this panel. It's nice to be back after the dormancy of COVID, and it's nice to see you. Uh, Colonel Graham, to me, was a very significant influence in my own professional career, and I'm grateful to be up here. Thank you. I think that, um, I, I mean, I know there have been a couple of different theories floated. Could you take the view that there's kind of forfeiture by estoppel because the, the, the Security Council member with the veto power is the one that is preventing what otherwise would certainly be some type of action under Article 39 and Article 42. I think the more interesting piece of this is to, re, is to really think about what the inherent right of collective self-defense means. I think normally when we think of collective self-defense, we think of a binary option. Either you're not doing anything or you're participating in hostilities on behalf of the party you're defending. But I would suggest that what's happening in Ukraine with all of the support that's being provided by so many nations is an invocation of the Article 51 authority to act in the absence of Security Council action in inherent self, uh, collective self-defense. Now, I don't think there have been any notifications provided to the Security Council. On the other hand, I don't think a state is obligated to go from zero to 100 miles per hour in the sense that we do nothing or we join the fight, that the state has the sovereign prerogative to choose what methods are most logical and effective for providing that collective self-defense um, support. And I was thinking about this, when we, even if we think about the, the 1986 uh, paramilitaries case, Nicaragua versus the United States, we remember that the United States defended its activities in Nicaragua by arguing it was an action of collective self-defense on behalf of El Salvador, who was being threatened by the support from Nicaragua for the FMLN in El Salvador. So it, th there was no suggestion that we were directly involved in hostilities in El Salvador to support El Salvador. Nonetheless, what we were doing with our paramilitary support for the Contras in Nicaragua was asserted as an exercise of collective self-defense. Um, and, and the other piece of this, I think, that we'll weave through a number of these questions is, what is the, I mean, what is the downside for states kind of pushing this limit? Russia is not, the, Vladimir Putin is the honey badger of international law, right? He, he is not going to care whether he has legal authority or not. He'll come up with a pretext legal authority for whatever he wants to do. So I think there's also an element of realpolitik here, that the, that the international community that is supporting Ukraine is simply saying we're dealing with a rogue state that has the ability to prevent the normal function of the Security Council from operating, and therefore we are going to act in a way that is consistent with our view of the norms of the international community. I've also read there have been arguments that we could treat it as an internationally wrongful act and that the support to Ukraine would qualify as a countermeasure against Russia for their international, internationally wrongful act of aggression and blocking Security Council action. My view is that the best legal argument comes from Article 51 and collective self-defense. Okay, collective self-defense under Article 51. Jeff, would that legal rationale also be the legal rationale you'd put forward 
uh, as a legal basis for the economic sanctions that have been levied by these states uh, against the state as a whole and individuals within Russia, or are we talking about a different legal rationale there? Well, I mean, I think the economic sanctions that are imposed by individual states are much more within the realm of sovereign prerogative. I mean, there's no requirement that a state allow another state to take advantage of its, its economic or financial capabilities. I'm not, I'm not sure that the United States or, or any EU state would need an international legal rationale to restrict Russian access to markets, finance, et cetera. But I think it could also fall within the scope of that authority. Again, I think that Article, what, what's interesting to me is when we were taught this, you know, we taught this at JAG school, we think of Article 51, we think instinctively of a military kind of uh, join the conflict fight, the, the response to North Korean aggression against South Korea before the Security Council acted, the United States Truman was committing co combat capabilities to defend South Korea. We think of that as the norm of Article 51. I think Ukraine has changed that equation. And I think it really requires us to recognize that collective self-defense under Article 51 can be much more subtle. It doesn't, it's not an all or nothing equation, and it's a sovereign prerogative to decide how to exercise that collective support. Okay, Article 51, collective self-defense. Lori, the last time I checked, uh, the law of neutrality was still alive and kicking, even though the United Nations has come into existence. And states have obligations and responsibilities under the law of neutrality. What, what's your take on whether neutrality has any role to play here now that we've heard that Jeff says this is just a, a collective self-defense action under Article 51? Does neutrality still have a role to play here? So first, um, I also want to thank um, General Dunlap. Um, it's always a pleasure to be back here at Duke. And I also um, need to say that um, I'm speaking here in my personal capacity, and none of my remarks represent um, the views of anybody. The and Department you, and of you Defense, know, this is, this is um, absolutely or the Office of General Counsel. All three of us throughout our careers have had to issue a disclaimer. This is the first time That's right. <laughs> that Lori has had to do that. So welcome to the club. That's your well, statement. the first time here, but yes. That's your statement of neutrality. <laughs> That's right. Okay. So, um, so I think ever since the beginning um, of the renewed invasion that today is the um, one year anniversary of, there, there has been a lot of discussion um, or at least reference to neutrality law. Um, just for some situational awareness, we find the basic tenets that um, Dave is referencing in the Hague Convention 5 and Hague Convention 13 from 1907. And neutrality law at its base seeks to protect the sovereignty and integrity of neutral states and prevent escalation of conflict, right? One of the goals dating back before World War II and the founding of the United Nations, but certainly a key goal um, of the international legal architecture we have now is that when there are disputes that flare up into armed conflict, we don't want those to spread like wildfire to other countries. We want to try to contain conflict. Um, your point at the beginning that we're talking about an international armed conflict is obviously critically important for any conversation of neutrality law because it's only relevant in context of international armed conflict. So in general, neutral states are prohibited from allowing belligerent parties to use their territory as a base of military operations or for any other exercise of belligerent rights. And neutrality law is also understood um, to include a prohibition against supplying belligerents with military equipment based on the core tenet of impartiality that is fundamental to the idea of neutrality. We tend to have those words go together. Um, one of the things that we're seeing here that's um, been a key piece of the conversation, however, is this idea of qualified or benevolent neutrality, um, which dates back at least to um, the early years of World War II, it is um, a U.S., uh, the U.S. is a proponent of this doctrine. Um, I believe you can 
look through the 1200 some odd pages of the DOD law of war manual and find it. I can't, I don't have the pin site for you, but you can feel free to page through and find reference to qualified neutrality. But the idea is that when we're in a situation where there is an aggressor state and a victim of aggression, that neutral states can distinguish between those, the qualities of being aggressor and the qualities of being victim of aggression. And that's different from a situation in which you don't have an aggressor state and a clear manifestation of aggression. We traditionally see um, the UN Security Council as the determiner um, of when there has been aggression. That is one of the roles of Article 39 of the UN Charter and then the subsequent authorities that flow for the Security Council. But the idea of qualified neutrality is that this is sort of also a factual concept and is not solely based on UN Security Council action. And what's been interesting is particularly um, in last spring when sort of in some of the early discourse about um, the current state of this conflict. Um, and I, I just sort of as a sidebar, um, I think it's important to note that even though we see in the news that today is the one year anniversary of this conflict, the state of international armed conflict between these two countries has existed since 2014 when Russia first launched an incursion into Crimea and has been occupying it since then. So you'll often hear the word renewed further in front of the word invasion to make sure that we're not losing that 2014 to 2022 time frame. Um, but in this context, the UN Security Council is blocked. So does that mean that the idea of aggression and I think blatant, brazen aggression um, disappears because we don't have the UN Security Council able to make its Article 39 declaration. And what's been, you know, I think was an interesting piece of the discourse, um, certainly last spring, and I think it continues on, is that this is a situation where we have to think a bit more um, nimbly, um, a bit more just sort of objectively and say, just because the Security Council is blocked doesn't mean um, that we can't recognize the existence of aggression. Um, we have over 140 states voting for the UN General Assembly resolution uh, identifying Russia's aggression back in March of last year. I think the same 141, I don't know if they're actually the same, but it was remarkably the same number of 141 yesterday in the UN General Assembly resolution that was passed calling on Russia to withdraw its forces. So the, to, to um, sort of sum up, I think we can add to the very traditional conceptions of neutrality, this idea of qualified neutrality. Um, and this seems to be the kind of example that really highlights why um, that idea sort of came into existence and has continued to be in existence. It's not, um, I think, universally relied upon, but certainly okay. this is a okay. setting where it's appropriate. So collective self-defense under Article 51, uh, these states seem to be okay there. They don't seem to be violating any international law in terms of the law of neutrality. And yet the fact remains that they've provided all of this, all of this material, support and assistance, really tipping the scale of the conflict. So I am assuming uh, that under international law, uh, these states, the EU and NATO, have in effect become co-belligerents. And as co-belligerents in this conflict, they're subject, are they not, to attack by Russia themselves? Jeff, you have any thoughts on that? That would seem to be the way it would flow to me. Well, I think that would be this, the way it would flow if we are applying traditional neutrality obligations. I'm not sure you could even, you would even have to get to co-belligerent. If you would say, for example, the Poles are training Ukrainian forces on how to operate a Leopard 2 tank in Poland, then if we're applying the, the doctrine of neutrality, Poland is violating its obligation of neutrality and Russia would have a right of self-help. 
I'm not so sure. I mean, I, I have to say, I think this assertion of qualified or, or benevolent, benevolent neutrality is a bit of an oxymoron. <laughs> I mean, you're either neutral or you're not. And, um, and all of the treaties that uh, Laurie referenced, that we know all this law predated the UN Charter. The idea of neutrality in the UN Charter is also, has always created a bit of a friction. I think there have been other situations where states have made a decision that even though there's not a Security Council authorization, they're acting to support one belligerent in favor of the other because they make a determination that there's been a blatant act of aggression. I mean, the, the, the UK armed forces would have had a hard time defeating the Argentinians in the Falklands in 1982 if the United States had not provided the Sidewinder missile, which arguably the Argentinians could have claimed was a, a prohibited item under uh, neutrality law. But we made a decision that there was a blatant aggressor and we were going to support the, the other side. So I, I, I struggle with the whole notion of neutrality. But yes, I think if the United States is training Patriot operators in El Paso or the Poles are training Leopard 2 operators in Poland uh, or they're, they're, they're transporting vital military equipment through neighboring states, Russia would have a, a, a legitimate claim of action under the law of neutrality. Co-belligerent to me, what I struggle with is, at this point, why do we worry about it, honestly? I mean, I guess if, if an American service member were captured by the Russians, then there would almost certainly be an assertion that that individual is entitled to prisoner of war status. But I don't think that this whole notion of co-belligerency, I, th I just think it's a bit of a legal red herring at this point. We have one side that clearly doesn't care about international law. The, the, the calculation of whether I'm going to launch an attack on a training base in Poland, in my view, in the Kremlin, has nothing to do with international legal authority. Their whole war is in violation of international legal authority. It's just a, it's just a real politic equation. Is it something I could get away with or not? Um, so I, I, again, why I think, haven't they? Why haven't they? Well, because I think that there that that much to uh, Vladimir Putin's chagrin, the 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 calculation of what he could get away with, which let's be honest, was informed by Western tolerance for what Laurie's already talked about over a number of years, was wrong, and now he's facing a very difficult situation, and he has to make a calculus: Do I want to expand the conflict? He can barely deal with the Ukrainian armed forces. Does he really want to expand the conflict to an actual hot war with NATO? And I think the, it, it's obvious that he's, he's concluded no. But if you're looking for a legal rationale, you can make an argument that the, the NATO countries have become co-belligerents. I don't even think you have to go there. You can just make the argument that they're breaching their obligation under the law of neutrality. And when they do so, it gives Russia a right of self-help if they wanted to act. But okay, and, and, and yet the issue of co-belligerency has been very much on the minds of some. Let, let me bring Rob into the conversation here. Robin, I actually have a two-part question for you, and it's a little legal and a little political. Do you think the fear of being designated a co-belligerent has, to a certain effect, impacted the very conservative, cautious approach the EU and NATO have taken with respect to the types of weapons and weapon systems they've provided to Ukraine and the reluctance uh, in which they have provided those weapon systems. They've done it on a very incremental basis. And then secondly, uh, if not overtly, I think at least implicitly, NATO and the U.S. in particular has really cautioned the Ukrainians from striking legitimate military objectives in Russia itself. They've said, why don't you restrict your targeting selection to eastern Ukraine, but let's forget about hitting targets in Russia itself when we know that in responding to an act of aggression, you can use a proportionate degree of force necessary to prevent that aggression from occurring. They have a legitimate right to do so. So why the cautionary tale on the part of NATO, in particular the United States? Two-part question. You have thoughts on that? I do. Thank you very much. And I'll just uh, echo the other panelists. Uh, uh, 
Thanks, uh, General Dunlop, who just stepped out for uh, uh, having me here, and it's, it's a real honor to be a part of this panel. Um, I'm also a, a member of the Department of the Army, so I'll state the disclaimer that I'm speaking for myself here. Um, I, I think Professor Korn <laughs> persuasively explained why um, this is a political issue, an international relations issue, first and foremost. I think, however, um, it's worth at least walking through the legal analysis here, um, and then maybe explaining what, uh, and then maybe returning to Professor Korn's point about why it's really not moving the needle much. Um, so, two bodies of law relevant to this question: neutrality and um, armed conf uh, law of armed conflict, specifically the co-belligerency question. As Professor Blank. Uh, just explained. Uh, she explained the law of neutrality. It's an important body of law related to the law of armed conflict. It's designed to protect sovereignty. It's designed to, pre to prevent escalation. It basically says if you're not a party to the armed con under neutrality, you're not a party to the armed conflict, you're a neutral party, you're not you're a non-belligerent, and you have certain duties, you have certain rights. You, uh, those duties include um, impartial conduct towards the belligerent parties, and refraining from providing war-related goods and services to the belligerents. Right, so that would seemingly be implicated by the US and other NATO countries' provision of support to Ukraine. Um, the law of neutrality doesn't have any real, anything really to say about the kind of weapon provided, whether they're F-16 F jets or uh, or HIMARS or other uh, of the more far-reaching artillery that's been proposed, tanks, right? The, lo the law of neutrality just isn't concerned with the type of weapon. It's concerned with of, of remaining impartial. So, no, I don't think um, the question of what kinds of weapons to provide is... Uh, is determined by the law of neutrality. And I don't think that changes under so-called qualified neutrality. Under, uh, under qualified neutrality, as, as my two co-panelists just explained, the, if you're, you're allowed as a neutral party to make a distinction between a clear aggressor and a non-aggressor. Again, uh, however, in providing um, assistance to the uh, victim state, there's no um, rule. Uh, the, the type of weapon you're providing isn't isn't relevant. So I don't think that under the law of neutrality that uh, is I don't think the law of neutrality is impacting uh, decisions about weapons type. Co belligerency is a separate question. Co, co belligerency is the idea of two states fighting an armed conflict against another state, right? Two states working together on one side of the armed conflict, fighting an, uh, an opposing state. The legal question here is just the international armed conflict question, right? So an international armed conflict arises between two states when uh, there's a resort to armed force between states. That's uh, the so-called Tadish test. It comes from a case from the uh, um, International Criminal Tribunal of the former Yugoslavia. It's a low threshold for international armed conflict, um, purportedly low threshold. And uh, so the idea is that when two states are engaged in armed force against one another, there's an international armed conflict. The question of co-belligerency is just, therefore, for these third states, for the United States and other NATO countries who are providing support to Ukraine, the question, the legal question is, is the provision of this support by the third state, United States and others, to Ukraine, does it create an international armed conflict between Russia and the United States or whatever third state we want to consider? Um, the, the answer mostly is going to be no, right? Because it's not a, it, we're designing this, uh, this support in a way that prevents direct military confrontation. We're providing these weapons uh, systems for Ukraine to use, um, and then they can use it for direct confrontation with Russia, but the United States and others are avoiding this question. So, the, so we're designing the support in a way that prevents 
us from engaging directly with Russia, and therefore there's no resort to force between the United States and Russia, and therefore there's no armed conflict between international armed conflict between the United States and Russia, and therefore uh, it, we're not co-belligerents. So it, it sounds well. It sounds like there's a lot of having our cake and eating it too here. Uh, boy, this is great. You can you can supply all the weapons in the world uh, to another state. You can tip the balance of the conflict. Are we saying that we can supply material, intelligence support, target selection support, but as long as we don't have boots on the ground, uh, we are not a co-belligerent, and Russia can't view us as a co-belligerent and act accordingly? Anybody have any thoughts on that? I, I think you, you say, can we? Right. The, 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 the bigger question is, is there a legal basis for doing it? We can do what the policymakers decide we can get away with. And, and, and I think you've seen this incremental walk to the line. Um, I, I dis, I, I'm, I'm, think, I'm hearing in my mind the voice of somebody that we all had such tremendous respect for, Hayes Parks, where he would say, where I'd say in the meeting, are we in an, an international armed conflict with X? And he would say, what is the issue you're trying to resolve? Right? Instead of the abstract of are we in the conflict or not, what is the issue? So for me, the question is the question you raised earlier. Does, are we giving Russia a legitimate legal basis to conduct operations against the United States or against uh, EU nations because of the support they're providing? And that's why I think the, the issue of co-belligerency is is a second level question. The first level question is, does the law of neutrality have any relevance? If it does, then I think Rob is, again, right on the money that what's being provided is inconsistent with the treaty and customary law of neutrality, and that law provides the, the, the aggrieved belligerent a right of self-help. And so, and I, but the irony is now you have a, a, a nation that's engaged in a blatant act of aggression that prevents the UN Security Council from responding to it, and now they're going to what? They're going to invoke customary international law as a basis for their legal right to conduct hostilities against the United States or, or EU partners? Well, I think the answer is much simpler than that. I think the answer is Article 5 of the, of the NATO Alliance Treaty. You really think Putin is going to go after? No, no, that was the point I made, that it's a real politic issue. We have been pushing the line from the very beginning. We've been, we've been incrementally ratcheting up the amount of support, and it's all very calculated from a national security policy perspective, both for the U.S. And, and the U.S. Russia's not going to respond. Right, and I think that when you, you bring up the point that we've put limits on how you're allowed to use these weapon systems, because there must be some assessment in the intelligence community, in the policy community, that there are some red lines that, that we have to be very careful of crossing, and we'll get away with everything we can get away. We're using a proxy state in many senses to defeat Russian forces on the battlefield, but I don't think that makes us a co-belligerent. I agree with Rob. Okay, let's, let's very briefly, Laurie. So I think we have to add in the, the role of rhetoric here, um, which is that one of the reasons that the co-belligerency concept has a lot of legs here is because we see Russia using that language in talking about NATO, in talking about the U.S., in talking about the West. And so there is a difference between, as Jeff has said, neutrality law and what your um, self-help resort options are there. And that is not related to. It sounds related to whether or not you're a party to the conflict, but they're different legal concepts. But it's very effective as a rhetorical tool to conflate legal concepts in order to make the political point that you want to make, to make the rhetorical point that you want to make. And one of the challenges is in both being precise about the law, but also both in your own legal analysis. What is, you know, when, when you're you know, commanders, when political leaders ask and want to do something, making sure that the analysis is precise.
but it's taking that precision into the public discourse that where it becomes extremely challenging because it is hard when you want to make lawyerly, like a state is trying to make lawyerly points in the face, right, and be precise in the face of, you know, a consistent efforts to conflate things in the rhetorical space, and it becomes extremely difficult. And this conversation begins to sound just exceedingly technical um, because while one issue is the sort of legal point that Jeff is making is does the provision of this provide a basis to take action against either that material, the, the movement of it, et cetera, that's a different question from, well, now there's a war between all these different states. But in the public discourse, they sound the same. And that's, I think, one of the big challenges here okay. as well. OK, I think, I think we've, we've worked that issue fairly thoroughly. Let's, let's move on to something else. I think here's something we can all agree on, that we have a consensus on, and that the Russian military has committed numerous, numerous war crimes uh, in the context of the ongoing conflict. Jeff, can you just very briefly, very briefly, speak to the types of crimes we're, we're talking about here? Well, I mean, I, I have, I'm on record many times of, of saying we have to be very careful about what I've called effects-based condemnations, that we look at the effects of combat operations and you draw an ipso facto conclusion that it must have been a war crime. Because in many situations, that's like asking or saying one plus I don't know equals five. If you don't know what the target was, if you don't know what the value was, if you don't know what the precautions that were implemented were, then you really can't make that judgment. But I think the Russian operations in Ukraine have shown us that there are certain uh, times when conduct of, conduct of hostilities have a res ipsa loquitur factor for, for violation of the law. That there just is no plausible basis when you watch a Russian tank unloading rounds into a um, civilian apartment building, and there's no plausible basis for concluding that that's a military objective that you can draw a, con a, a almost conclusive inference from the circumstantial evidence of the way that the attacks were conducted. Actually, I think the most, the, the clearest cut war crime is the deportation of protected persons from occupied territories. I mean, that, there, there's, there's, no, there's no way you can justify that in any way, se sense, or form. And yet, the, the, the war crimes that the international community is focused on are the visceral, visual, uh, destruction of property, killing of civilians, attack on civilians. So I would say, in, in responding to your question, you said, can you identify these alleged war crimes? I think as, and I'll, I'll put on my criminal law hat now, I think we have to be very careful when we say, can we identify? Identify in what sense? Is there a, uh, a basis for concluding that we should allege war crimes? Is there sufficient evidence to prove the war crime beyond a reasonable doubt? How do we factor issues in like defenses? So for example, one of the first cases that was reported that the Ukrainians prosecuted was a Russian soldier who shot a civilian on a bicycle out of a car. Now what, what don't we know about that? Did his sergeant order him to shoot that civilian? Was there some evidence that civilians were providing location of Russian forces using cell phones? Does that make them direct participants in hostilities? If there was even a plausible basis that that civilian may have been providing intelligence against Russian forces, would that soldier have had an obedience to orders defense? There are so many complications, I think, when we deal with conduct of hostilities, alleged war crimes. There was another case of Russian soldiers who were pulling the lanyard on artillery that was attacking civilian targets. Well. If you've been an artilleryman and you're ordered to pull the lanyard and indirect fire, you're not normally told what the target is. You're told a grid coordinate or, a, or some other coordinate. How, does, how do we factor all of this in? So I, my answer is I don't see how anybody could dispute the conclusion that there is a plausible basis that Russian forces are pervasively and routinely violating, the, as you said earlier, the most basic obligations of the law of armed conflict. Let me... Let me give you a, a specific example. Uh, every night we turn on the news and the, and the media and the television reports 
The Russians are attacking the Ukrainian infrastructure. They, they're attacking the Ukrainian infrastructure, specifically the electrical grids. War crimes, war crimes. Well, that's just my... That, this is, is that my, really the case? Well, this is my point about one plus I don't know equals five. I mean, we know that if we were fighting the Russians, then their power facilities would almost certainly qualify as lawful military objectives, and then we'd go through the process of determining whether we could implement feasible precautions, and then at the end we'd do the ultimate proportionality assessment. So <coughs> this is my point about the danger of effects-based condemnations. And remember, whatever we're saying now is going to play in other, in other theaters and other domains in the future. So I, I, I would just suggest when we talk about war crimes, we think about it in terms of the reality of warfare. I have no doubt that the Russian forces have committed um, pervasive war crimes in the conduct of hostilities. I also think, as you're suggesting, that some things that we are automatically condemning as war crimes, if we, if we knew all the facts and circumstances, would be a harder case to make beyond a reasonable doubt that what you did was a violation of, of, of the rules of war. Yeah, because let's don't forget, we obviously have guys in black hats and guys in white hats in this conflict. We have an aggressor state and we have a victim state. But once that conflict occurs, what happens? The law of armed conflict in its totality applies, okay? And Ukraine is just as committed to complying with the law of armed conflict as Russia is. Once the conflict begins, all of the law of armed conflict applies. Okay, let's get to what may in fact be the most important issue that the panel is going to discuss. And that's the issue of accountability. Uh, the ongoing Russian inactions constitute not simply a threat to the territorial integrity and political independence of Ukraine. And I'm preaching a little here, but I, I'm doing it intentionally. In reality, they pose a fundamental breach of an overt challenge to the system of global stability that has been in place since the end of the Second World War, well over 75 years as well as a threat to the basic principles of international law that serve as the under, undergirding system for this entire system. How then does the international community, given the inability of the UN to act in this situation, hold the Russian leadership, both civilian and military, responsible for their actions, for their international crimes, for the aggressive war being waged, for the war crimes being committed in the context of that aggressive war. And more realistically, is this even a possibility? So let's start with judicial remedies. What are the judicial remedies available? And I begin here with the ICC, the International Criminal Court. Now the ICC has jurisdiction over genocide, crime against mankind, War crimes and the waging of aggressive war. What about the ICC? We know that it's already seized with this situation to a certain extent. But do we place our trust in the ICC? Anybody on the panel? I mean, if you if you, look, I, we, I think as an international community, we have to come to terms with the fact that we've got to use what we've got. I'm, I personally have not been overly impressed with the ICC, but that may be the best option other than uh, Ukrainian assertion of jurisdiction over the people that it has. Of course, the ICC is going to, they're, 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 when we talk about accountability, I think we have to be careful. Accountability for international crimes ultimately is you're in the dock, you're being tried, and, are, and if you've committed the crimes, you're convicted and you serve a punishment. But there's also kind of a naming and shaming element to this. So the mere fact that the ICC prosecutor is investigating these crimes, if the, uh, if the pretrial chamber approves um, indictments, then you may never get your hands on these people, or it may be a long time, but the sword of Damocles is dangling over their head for the rest of their lives. I don't think that's insignificant. I think there's value to it. There is a, there is a limit to what international law can do in these situations, particularly when you're dealing with a very powerful state run by a tyrant that can control everything that happens within its borders. And short of regime change in Russia, I think the prospect, you, you list 
senior level political and military leaders, I think the prospect of actually seeing them in uh, a tribunal like Milosevic was is very low. But I don't think that means we can't we should just ignore the process of investigating, accusing through a formal uh, accusation document like an indictment, and then doing our best to try and bring that person well, to let's, justice. Let's move from the ICC then. What about what about a specially constituted court like the ICTY and the ICTR, Yugoslavia and and Rwanda? Now we know that's going to be difficult. Uh, to be done by the UN because it's subject to veto, uh, both Russian veto and most probably uh, Chinese veto. But what about a specially constituted court? That's been bandied about uh, quite a bit. Any any prospects for that? Lori, Rob, you have any thoughts on that? So I think we need to recognize that there are some different avenues both based on capacity, based on jurisdiction, based on the crime at hand. The special tribunal that you're referencing is being talked about in the context of the crime of aggression because, for one thing, the ICC, in this particular scenario, doesn't have jurisdiction to prosecute aggression because under the ICC um, rules for jurisdiction over the crime of aggression, both of the states involved in the conflict need to be party uh, parties to the Rome Statute. Russia is not, Ukraine has provided a referral um, supported by some 43 states, um, which I think is the first time we've seen a number of states sort of join in one state's referral to the ICC. Russia is not a party, so aggression is simply off the table for the ICC. Um, regardless of whether, of all the other interesting questions about the ICC, aggression simply is not in the in the mix. So that's why the idea of a special tribunal is being discussed, because um, when we think about accountability, we think about it sort of in the big picture, and I'll defer to those who, who you know, teach, teach criminal law in this space, but we think about why, right? What are the goals of accountability? What are the sort of core principles of, of criminal law that we're seeking to achieve with accountability? And if you leave an entire crime unaddressed, you're not able to get at those goals with respect to, for example, deterrence, you know, um, moral imperative, uh, justice for the victims, all the different things. Um, one thing I want to sort of come back to, though, is, is the idea of, of capacity and capability. And um, I see we have a few students from Georgetown Law. Some of you may have had the opportunity to hear the Ukrainian prosecutor general when he spoke at Georgetown a few weeks ago. Um, and he put out a number in terms of the cases that they have, that they're sort of on their docket, in essence, not that they've initiated, but that they're investigating, and it's somewhere over 50,000 cases. Am I right? If either, I see two Georgetowns, if either of you were there. Um, that's a lot of cases, right? I mean, I need a lot of hands to kind of get up to 50,000. Um, there is a pure capacity issue and this, to me, is one where we think about marshalling all the possible resources that are available in the accountability space um, and thinking about why we, we value um, accountability processes in the, in the state where the conflict is occurring, in the value of Ukraine bringing cases, why we have value to an international process, why we have value for other domestic other states to um, proceed in their own courts, like we've seen, for example, a number of European countries prosecuting in their domestic courts crimes committed by ISIS and other crimes in Syria. Um, all of these have value in sort of the, the tapestry of accountability for international crimes. And I, I think we, we, we want to recognize that value and also put energy where capacity can be put to its best use. Um, and not um, sort of decry the inability to do something here, but rather say, okay, well, can we do it over here? Okay, I, I see Rob wants to weigh in on this. <clears throat> Briefly, Rob. Yes, so I, I, I think that enforcement's obviously a major challenge. It's what people typically think of first when they think of uh, these issues. I would just say as a, <clears throat> I'm a professor at West Point, I teach some cadets, we've got a couple in the room here, 
Um, this is the thing that cadets want to talk about. This is what students want to talk about enforcement and why it, you know it's it's seemingly hopeless. So I think Professor Korn's point about going through the process, the investigatory process, is important. I think there's a lot of value in that rule of law value, signaling value about our uh, about what we believe in. But I think it also, and I do this is how I do it with my students is, I think it's it's a it's a good opportunity to ask. Uh, what the function of the international law is. Professor Blank, you were talking about this a moment ago. Skepticism is prevalent about international law. Students are always skeptical about it, mostly because of, a, of enforcement. So I like to, I mean, I like to push on that and ask, you know, so what is the function of international law? And it, it depends on who your subject is. I like to use the example, the, the so-called the bad man, Holmes, Holmes's article, uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes' article about the bad man. To the bad man, right, the person who has ill intent and subversive intent, <clears throat> that person just cares about the rules to the extent that they can avoid sanction, right? So enforcement for that person is the, is the focus, right? They're worried about being punished. Um, and so that's why they comply with the law, or that's why they either comply with the law of war, seek ways to violate it without, um, without with a, avoiding enforcement. <clears throat> but in a classroom with cadets, it, it, there's so much more to the law that the, fun, the law serves this function of, of uh, for the, that audience, those subjects who internalize it and value it as as a reason for action, not just as a potential punishment, but as a reason for action. And there's a lot of value in, in, in talking to cadets and students in general and saying, look, enforcement's a problem, but it, should we just give up on the law? Should we just abandon the project? And the, and the answer you get after you push a little bit is, no, actually we shouldn't because Enforcement is about ensuring compliance, and the way you ensure compliance, um, wit, uh, the, the most effective way to ensure compliance is to instill a values-based approach to the law to ensure compliance in the first instance, right? Internalizing the values that are underlying these rules. So yes, skepticism uh, is prevalent, right? Skepticism is a, pro is a, is a challenge. And there's good reasons, frankly, for skepticism, especially when it comes to enforcement. Okay. But with students, it's important to get beyond that. What, what about the, the concept of different states, and by states I mean different countries in the international community, exercising universal jurisdiction over international crimes in their own state courts? You know, Spain and Germany have done this recently. They've done it in absentia for a lack of in personam jurisdiction, something that Jeff spoke to. But is there any possibility of, of that happening? Well, I mean, why not? I, I, as I recall, Tadic, who you mentioned, was turned over to the ICTY by the Swiss government. I think he was pending trial by the Swiss government under their universal jurisdiction statute. It's interesting for U.S. practitioners because this is something that we've always been a little bit uh, uneasy about. You know that very well. The original version of the War Crimes Act rejected the State Department's recommendation that it embrace universal jurisdiction. We know that's just recently been amended. Um, but I think universal jurisdiction does play an accountability role. If somebody ends up in your, in your jurisdiction and you find out they committed a, a grave or a, a serious violation of international law and your law provides for accountability, that's part of the mosaic of accountability in international law, but, does, but, does I'm with, but let me just make a point. I'm with <coughs> Rob here. I mean, there's something about war crimes that you see visually where people have this attitude, or the reaction is, the system is broken if everybody responsible is not held accountable. Here's a, a news flash. People get away with crime in every criminal jurisdiction in, in the world. Not every criminal is caught. Not every criminal is charged. Not every criminal is convicted when they are charged. This is a reality of criminal law. It's an, it, it's an imperfect system. And at the international level, there are, there are more obstacles and challenges 
that have to be confronted, it doesn't mean you abandon the project. It doesn't mean you, you the, the system has evolved substantially. And I think the fact that this is being investigated, that there are 50,000 cases, that there are individuals being brought to trial, that other states are asserting a universal jurisdiction, that the United States government in a, I think it was a unanimous vote in Congress, which is unheard of today, <laughs> amended the War Crimes Act so that in the future, if we get physical jurisdiction over somebody from this conflict who committed a grave breach of the Geneva Convention, a U.S. attorney would have the option of bringing them to trial. And that's, all of this is a, part of a, a mosaic. That's a significant development because... Although, you, I, I, you did ask the question about command responsibility, and this is a bit of a technical uh, and criminal law question, and I know one of the distinguished professors here is a former uh, U.S. attorney, and there may be others, but if we were to get a Russian general, let's say, in the United States, and we wanted to prosecute that individual on a theory of command responsibility. If you're charging somebody under yeah, explain a... Explain what that is, Jeff. Well, command responsibility <laughs> is you are... It's a theory of accomplice by recklessness, essentially. If you should have known your subordinates were going to commit crimes, and then they occurred, you're accountable as a principal. The, to me, I think one of the challenges with this amendment is what, what mode of liability provision would apply to a war crimes allegation under the War Crimes Act? Would it be the international law mode of liability, command responsibility, or would you be restricted by the United States Code, which is traditional aiding and abetting responsibility? And I think Congress would be wise to look at including within the War Crimes Act itself the same mode of liability that, ironically, they have incorporated into the Military Commission Act. Because if you look at the Military Commission Act provision on principles, it specifically includes Yamashita command responsibility should have known standard. That's not in the UCMJ for our forces. That's not in the United States Code for federal criminal offenses. So I think that, that if that's what we're, we're hoping for in the future, that maybe we'll have an opportunity to bring a general or, or a senior political leader to accountability in our own courts, that if I were a defense lawyer, I would move to dismiss any allegation based on command responsibility because it's not incorporated into the federal statute. Okay, I want to close with one final question to the panel before we open it up for questions from the audience. And, and that's, this is more of a, a philosophical question than a legal question, but obviously you can't bring the state of Russia itself into the dock. Uh, but should the, the Russian populace as a whole uh, bear some sort of responsibility for the waging of this aggression, aggressive war by the Russian leadership? And if so, how would you go about doing that? Uh, I, I just fundamentally disagree with that. The idea of kind of total war and that the population is accountable, this is, there are regime elites who are accountable. And they're there because the population does not have a say in the policy. And my brother was a diplomat in Russia for four, four years. And for him, this is heartbreaking on both sides. I mean, 100 or 200,000 young Russian men and women killed in this country. For what? <laughs> and and this, this is, a, to me, a classic manifestation of the democratic peace theory. You've got, you've got war because one of the parties to the conflict has leaders that are unaccountable to the people who are being forced to suffer through their bad decisions. So punishing the Russian people uh, in some way, I, I just have a fundamental disagreement with that, that theory. I, th I think one of the, your question is important because it points to one of the reasons why we have accountability processes in the international system, and that is specifically to, to apply individual notions of guilt and not collective notions of guilt and to break the sort of collective cycle of violence and revenge and re-vengeance and on and on. And those of you who have studied um, any number of conflicts in the past that have sort of long historical tales that wag the dog, in essence, know that the ability to resort to, well, that group did it before, so now we're going to do it to them, is one of the strongest tools that, uh, that leaders have for sort of rallying the population to engage in you know, uh, support or engage in acts that are, you know, horrifying. Um, 
And so I think that's exactly what international accountability is designed to guard against, is the idea of seeing a, a collective group as responsible rather than individual people. And we can point to Justice Jackson's opening statement at Nuremberg. Those of you who haven't read it and you're studying in this area, go home tonight, make sure you read it. Don't wait till tomorrow. Um, but he really reinforces this idea that crimes are committed by men. Um, I think we could say today crimes are committed by men and women, um, people of all stripes, um, not by nations. Okay. Right? Okay. I think we've hit most of the questions I wanted to wanted to ask, and so I'll open it up yeah. for our audience, Charlie. If, if I could jump in and pose a couple questions, why the the uh, scholars are formulate them because they may be called on momentarily. But uh, it, this is such a rich discussion. Just so everybody knows, we are going to have another presentation on international justice. So this, these top, some of these topics will, will come back. Uh, there was an interesting article in the Washington Post not long ago that talked about, uh, the, I guess, the Ukrainian prosecutor was 66,000 cases, I think, talking about. And they made the comment that there are zero cases reported of investigating Ukrainian war crimes. Uh, if I could go through a couple thoughts, uh, I, tell us what you think about that. And then secondly, one of the things that um, my wife actually pointed out to me in the Washington Post, another Washington Post article a couple days ago, was that we talk about neutrality and what the world thinks and so forth. They pointed out that although it was this overwhelming vote in the General Assembly, the countries that did not support it represented the majority of the world's population. In fact, uh, they cited an economist report that said two-thirds of the people who are not condemning Russia uh, li live in countries that are not uh, condemning Russia. What does that mean for the future? And then finally, this is one that's really been, uh, I've been grappling with, is that uh, of the smartphone issue that I think Jeff raised. There was an article two days ago where the ICRC was talking evidently at the Munich conference about smartphone and cyber use because the Ukrainians have, have actually you know, empowered, I think, 18 million people to use their smartphones to report on things, uh, you know, Russian troop movements and so forth. And the ICRC is concerning that this is turning millions of people into direct, potentially directly involved in combatancy, which would make them lawful targets. A couple of ideas. Just on your first point, um, I'm not, just factually, I'm pretty sure there have been reports of Ukraine prosecuting Ukrainians. So I'm just more raising a factual yeah. question about and, the and premise had, of the been, article, I, I, and they I, have. So I think, yeah. and I think that's been seen to be an important aspect. Um, that There's a lot of, I think the Ukrainians are well aware that there's a lot of legitimacy riding on their um, adherence to the law and their willingness to investigate. And a quick follow-up to that. I don't have the stats, but... Quick follow-up to that. Another Washington Post article from back at March, when the Washington Post was reporting on Ukrainians putting military vehicles into civilian areas, uh, the, when it was brought to the attention of the uh, one of President Zelensky's advisors, they said, the law of war doesn't apply to us because we are the victims of aggression. Yeah, and that's, I, that's I, simply I, not true. If You know, fundamentally, if you take a look at Pictet's commentary, Article 1, the commitment that you make when you sign these international conventions is not a one-on-one -on -one contract. It's a commitment to the international community at large. And Pictet is very, very clear when he says that. It is a commitment to the international community at large. So whether you're an aggressor state or whether you're a victim state, the victim state has to comply with the law of armed conflict regardless of whether. It's, it, but I mean, it's, it's, it's not surprising political rhetoric. I mean, we can look back to after 9-11. Remember, the, the unlawful combatants were different because of the, the illegality of the, of the attacks that were launched on the United States. The lawyers know 
that that's not correct. There's an equality of application. And I think the Ukrainians, I mean, in, in some sense, I wonder if they, they, they must be, they're inundated with help on how to be legitimate, on how to make sure their forces are well trained, on how to impose accountability. I think they probably have more than they can handle in terms of external actors coming in and saying, I'm here to help, we'll help you make things better. Um, but so I, should we be surprised that there are more cases against Russians than yeah, there's, Ukrainians? there's no moral equivalence. Right. There's no. But but on your issue of on your issue of the, the population of the world, I mean, that's just a manifestation that there are countries that are not accountable to their populations. Take North Korea and China out of that vote. And what's the what's the equation then? Do I really think the Chinese government is acting in accordance with the will of its people? No, I don't. You know, there's an interesting uh, article that uh, the former Daniel Bornstein uh, wrote many years ago. It really kind of influenced me. He was the former, uh, you know, librarian of Cong Congress. It's called The Myth of Popular Innocence, that Americans tend to believe that populations have no responsibility. Do you know this one, Ron? Uh, have no responsibility. It's only the evil leaders. But, you know, populations may have some responsibility doesn't mean you can target them or, or even drag them into court but uh, you know and he pointed out Serbia a lot of Serbians like the idea of going after that's that's an interesting thought Charlie we can talk about that but with all due respect we've got five minutes left yeah <laughs> yeah we could have this yeah, sir we have 10, don't we? Right. Oh, we have 10. Thanks. Hello, I'm uh, Brian Cox. I'm a lecturer at Cornell Law School and retired uh, U.S. Army judge advocate. Uh, so, Lori, I just want to uh, take the liberty of filling in the blank on your uh, pen site citation for the DOD Law of War Manual um, citation for qualified neutrality. It's uh, 15.2.2 uh, for those who are interested. Well, thank you for in, that. Uh, and following <laughs> it up with that. Because uh, it's a really uh, fascinating. I think you guys really covered the, the waterfront on uh, the, the topic of neutrality, and so I really applaud that discussion. Uh, my question uh, involves uh, something that came up uh, in the, the topic of um, accountability for the crime of aggression. So the d discussion now is that w uh, we may create a uh, um, special international tribunal uh, for Ukraine through chapter or, uh, 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 chapter seven, or sorry, chapter six of the UN Charter, using the General Assembly rather than the Security Council. Uh, and so, my question uh, for you is: one, and this this would be a way to circumvent uh, Chapter Seven uh, veto, right, from the P five. Um, my question to you is: Do you assess that uh, that under Chapter Six, the General Assembly actually does have uh, legal authority to establish a special uh, international tribunal for the crime of aggression? Given that uh, most of the ad hoc or all the ad hoc tribunals that we've had prior to this were uh, were formulated by uh, Chapter Seven, specifically Article Forty Two of the Charter, uh, and then if we do establish uh, kind of if we, we only have a minute left. Yep, if we so circumvent let's... the the, U, the uh, Chapter Seven uh, veto, are we concerned that uh, that we may fragment uh, the United Nations? Thanks. I think there's a number of considerate of possible avenues that are being discussed with respect to a potential special tribunal for aggression. Um, and there's a lot of interesting questions about the jurisdictional basis. Um, do you consolidate the jurisdiction of multiple countries? There's a number of folks who have written on this. Um, one option is the idea of the General Assembly one option is the idea of it being a Ukrainian court with support, and they all have different um, sort of aspects in thinking about jurisdiction and thinking about what would be the applicable law what would, and so on and so forth. Um, I don't think um, that there is uh, one single settled upon way that the international community or that um, discussions about this are proceeding. And I, I mean, it would be somewhat, you know, it, it, we haven't had a special tribunal on aggression, yeah, unless, you know, with the exception of Nuremberg, um, which on some way was in fact a special, I mean, that's right, it tried aggression. Um, so there, I think there's a lot of, um, a lot of interesting questions about jurisdiction, but I mostly just want to point out that that's not the only avenue that's being discussed. That's one, and they all have 
interesting aspects to them or challenges? My answer is no. I don't think the, the under Chapter 6 it's viable because I think an ad hoc tribunal is an exercise of the responsibility to contribute to international peace and security. That was the motivation for the ad hoc tribunals that the Security Council has approved. And if you go down that road, then what you're doing is you're exacerbating what is really a very complicated question that nobody seems to be raising, which is, what is the ultimate priority of the international legal system? Is it accountability or international peace and security? If Putin came out today and said, we're going to withdraw all our forces from Ukraine, we're going to terminate the conflict, but the condition is the Security Council has to enact a resolution giving immunity to me and my leaders for anything we've done, and they did that, should that take priority over the ICC and their effort to prosecute senior leaders? I mean, this, this was the debate the United States had over the whole issue of joining the ICC. What is the ultimate priority of the international legal system? And you, you know where we came down that ultimately it's advancing international peace and security, and sometimes you have to hold your nose and accept the fact that somebody who should be accountable won't be accountable, because in the end it will enhance the re restoration of peace and security. So I don't think the General Assembly should have that authority. I'm afraid that's going to have to be the last, last word. Uh, fortunately, our, our panelists are going to stay around. I do want, I think we all need to really have a, a moment of silence to think about the horrifying suffering that the Ukrainian people have undergone. We have, we're talking in, in kind of uh, technical levels, and it's extremely important, but I think we, we really do need to think about that and just hope that we have a, a more peaceful future and figure out how we as lawyers and those interested in national security can contribute to it. And if the questions were easy, we wouldn't even be having a panel like this. It's just very important that we move forward. And I do want to say one thing. Uh, Professor Korn has a new book out, or a, actually a revision of his book. Oh, awesome. There are flyer, flyers, and just for us, we're getting a 20% discount if you pick up the flyer. Co-authored, not just me. Co-authored, yeah. There's, uh, there's some expert co-authors. So we're, we're going to take our break now. Hey, may I ask you to thank the panel? Okay. Yes. And, and believe me, we could have gone on like 10 hours further because I still want to hear my smartphone question answer. Thank, thank you. you very much. And um, thanks, guys. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.